Inshallah, we'll start with the recitation from the Holy Quran. Yahya will be reciting uh, a room, and uh, Rayyan will be start, uh, reciting Al Imran. And both are seniors and graduating this year, Inshallah. And both are Hafid of Quran. They memorized the whole Quran and they led our Tarawih prayer this year. Rayyan, here, Habibi. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وله الحمد في السماوات والأرض وعشيا وحين تبهرون يخرج الحي من الميت ويخرج الميت من الحي ويحيي الأرض بعد موتها وكذلك تخرجون ومن آياته أن خلقكم من تراب من تراب ثم إذا أنتم بشر تنتشرون ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين ومن آياته منامكم بالليل والنهار وابتغاؤكم من فضله إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يسمعون ومن آياته يريكم البرف خوفا وطمعا وينزل من السماء ماء فيحيي به الأرض بعد موتها إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يعقلون ومن آياته أن تقوم السماء والأرض بأمره ثم إذا دعاكم دعوة من الأرض إذا أنتم تخرجون أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الجيم So the closest meaning to the ayahs that I recited is uh, uh, sorry about that. All praise is due to him in the heavens and the earth So glorify him in the late afternoon and when the day begins to decline out the living from the dead and the death from the living and gives life to the earth after its death. Likewise, you shall be brought forth to life after your death. Of his signs is that he has cre created you from dust and there you are, people scattered throughout the earth. And of his signs is that he has created you from mates from among yourselves that you may find comfort from them. And he has planted love and mercy for each other in your hearts. Surely there are signs in this for those who think about it. And also of his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth and the difference of your language and colors. Surely there are signs in this for the knowledgeable. And among Allah's signs is your sleep at night and quest for his bounty during the day. Surely there are signs in this for those who listen. And of Allah's signs is the showing of lightning in which there is fear as well hope. And he sends down rainwater from the sky, and within it gives life to the earth after his death. Surely there are signs in those for the, who, who, are, who have common sense. And of his signs are the firmly standing heaven and earth by his command. Then as soon as he summons you out of the earth, you shall come forth at one call. Astaghfirullah al Inshallah, I'll recite a few verses from Sulaiman. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا 
ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخسنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد فاستجاب لهم ربهم أني لا أضيع عمل عامل منكم من ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض فالذين هاجروا وأخرجوا من ديالهم وأوذوا في سبيلي وقاتلوا وقتلوا لأكثرن عنهم سيئاتهم ولأدخلنهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ثوابا من عند الله والله عنده حسن الثواب أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the closest meaning Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of day and night, there are signs for those of people of reason. There are those who remember Allah while standing, sitting, and lying on their sides, and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth, and pray, Our Lord, you have not created all of us without purpose. Glory be to you. Protect us from the torment of the fire. Our Lord, Indeed, those who commit to the fire will be completely disgraced, and the wrongdoers will have no helpers. Our Lord, we have heard the caller to true belief proclaiming, Believe in your Lord alone. So we believe. Our Lord, forgive our sins, absolve us of our misdeeds, and allow us each to die as one of the virtuous. Our Lord, grant us with what you have promised us through your messengers, and do not put us to shame on the Day of Judgment, for certainly you never fail in your promise. So their Lord responded to them, I will never deny any of you, male or female, the reward of your deeds. Both are equal in reward. Those who migrated or were expelled from their homes and were persecuted for my sake and fought, and some were martyred, I will certainly forgive their sins and admit them into the gardens under which rivers flow as a reward from Allah. And Allah, and with Allah, is the finest reward. Assalamu alaikum everybody, my name is Jawad Khan. This is my 21st year here at the Muslim Educational Trust. And I could not be more proud of these young men and women who are graduating today because we have seen over all these years the progress and development of both our program, the students, and our community. When we first established Oregon Islamic Academy High School a long time ago, we knew that we needed a clearly defined roadmap of how students would develop spiritually and intellectually that would allow them to become the type of students who can apply anywhere, graduate from anywhere, and become whatever they want to be, while at the same time keeping in mind the Islamic ethos of community, and the good of the collective ummah. Our budget was limited. Our resources fewer than those of institutions and schools that wanted to achieve the same things. So we knew that the challenge would be great, and it was. 
but by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the work of staff, and the dedication of staff and volunteers and community, and the growth of these students, we've been able to achieve a great deal. First and foremost, applying to college from an Islamic school automatically opened doors that may not be open elsewhere, something that very few people know. A long time ago, many people assumed that a student applying from an Islamic school will be limited, since colleges may look upon that application warily. But yet, the opposite has proven to be true. Colleges and universities are looking to fill out their respective classes with diverse students representing diverse backgrounds, ethnicities, faiths, abilities, and geographies. And we have that amongst our graduates here today. We see the beautiful diversity of the Muslim community represented in this graduating classes and in our community. Because many of the most selective schools in the nation rarely get applications from Islamic school graduates, these students stand out. But more importantly, they need to be students' colleges and universities, one contributing to their campuses and learning communities. So we set out to foster graduates who embody the Islamic ethos of holistic worldviews, or Weltanschauung, as the Germans say, which has proven to be Mustafa Rashid, one of our graduates' favorite words. I'm sure he'll drop his speech tonight. Guided by the values and mores of our faith, we designed a plan in which students take a rigorous class load. We designed a plan for students in which we ask them their interests and seek to cultivate those interests in a variety of ways, through classroom extensions, internships, and leadership opportunities in which they receive the tools and guidance to start their own startups and organizations. Many, many years ago, people assumed that students graduating from an Islamic school would be limited in scope of experience of the real world. But the students you see graduating today have had the widest birth of experiences in which their voices have been heard and their talents have been explored. These students graduating today have interned at OHSU, Nike, Metro, Urban League, City of Beaverton. They have been on budget committees, council committees, election advisories and peer reviews. They've given presentations to elected officials, governmental organizations, schools, provided experienced testimonies, advocated for student rights, affordable housing, affordable bus fares. They fought for racial equity and diversity and representation while putting their own experiences into the view of others who may not know the experience of a young Muslim man or woman living in the United States. They are athletes. They are young scholars. They are community builders. They are hafid of Quran. But most importantly, they've shown to both their immediate community and the broader one, the beautiful face of Islam and Muslims. Our talents, our desire to better society, and our contributions to it. When colleges and universities look at the applications of these students, they see students who have uniquely developed their talents in a variety of fields, have taken on leadership roles, have invested their time in making their learning in broader communities better places to live. And we've seen how, praise be to Allah, successful they've been. Colleges and universities have reached out to these students, asking them to choose their respective schools to bring their diverse experience and viewpoints to campus. This year, for the very first time, I received messages and from schools actively recruiting our students, asking them to choose them over others, schools that only accept 7 to 8 percent of applicants from around the world. And I know both they and some of the students in the Honor Society and Youth Ambassadors Clubs in attendance today will groan at the thought of taking so many classes, typically 24 or more than the average Oregon graduate. But the colleges and universities... And I know both they and some of the students in the Honor Society and Youth have seen the dedication that these students have and what they contribute, and they want to see them on their campuses. It has been a great achievement over these years. May Allah continue to bless these students and our families. 
in our programs to continue to develop and foster leadership amongst our students. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and we continue to bless them and their families in the days to come, inshallah. Assalamu Before I leave my home, we're going to play a video which is our annual report of the activities that the Muslim Educational Trust has been a part of over the past year. Some of them you may know, some of them you may not know. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. While I can't be with all of you in person, I do want to acknowledge first the incredibly important work that the Muslim Educational Trust has been doing throughout these incredibly challenging days. The Muslim Educational Trust is an enormous community asset and one that has played a key role as Oregon works to curb the pandemic. I'd especially like to thank Wajdi and the Muslim Educational Trust for holding this very important conversation and to thank them for hosting the numerous other webinars they've had that are like this one. And especially important is the fact that I want you to know I'm so looking forward to the day as we've done in the past, where we all can safely gather in person. I'm enormously grateful for the role MET has played as a bridge builder, as a convener, as providing a safe place for people of all faith, and has helped us as a community come together and celebrate what, what we share in common. We will only make progress as a community when we celebrate what we share in common, and MET has been in the forefront of doing that. Assalamu alaikum, my brothers and sisters. What a year it has been. The Muslim Educational Trust and the rest of the nation have experienced a devastating pandemic that has affected the way we live our lives, how we think about our communities, and the systems that govern them, including the impact on the most vulnerable amongst us, challenging all of us to continue to reimagine how we can all help in the process of healing and unifying. Praise be to God that the Muslim Educational Trust has risen to the challenge during these trying times, serving as a communal service locus point for the Portland Metro community, helping those most in need through spiritual, economic, social, and personal support while continuing to impact the public square through our new online programming that has not only added to the Portland Metro area's culture, spiritual, and educational needs, but has also combated Islamophobia, bigotry, and hate with overarching themes of love, unity, and healing. In response to the growing need for emergency food supplies caused by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we began growing our emergency food box program, an extension of our Halal Food Pantry, which assists Portland area families, many from the refugee, immigrant, and other marginalized communities. Through this program, MET has now reached over 27,000 people and over 6,000 families and counting. This past year, MET diversified its outreach in a variety of ways. In the spring of 2020, MET began its American Muslims in the Public Square webinar series, highlighting the rich diversity of race and ethnicity within the Muslim community, as well as the diversity of experience in how Muslim doctors, business people, college presidents, lawyers, judges, and others are adding to the fabric of this country. In response to the social upheaval that has brought the fight for racial and systematic justice to the forefront, MET launched its Healing Ourselves to Heal Our Beloved Community webinar series. That explores current issues that affect the Muslim as well as the broader community and explores how we can address the challenges we faced in a holistic manner to bring about a better world. 
MET also hosted the fifth annual Building Bridges of Understanding Summit, bringing together local and federal law enforcement, as well as 72 different community organizations to reimagine public safety during the unprecedented challenges of the last year. MET proudly served as a U.S. Census Center in partnership with We Count Oregon, hosting a training summit for hundreds of language ambassadors and over the course of 2020 spread awareness to thousands of individuals throughout the Portland metro area about the census importance as well as assisting hundreds of people in filling out the census forms. Additionally, MET served as an SAT testing center in December of 2020 and March of 2021, becoming the first Muslim organization in the United States to do so. The December test drew test takers from Washington and Idaho as our center was the only open SAT test site in the entire Pacific Northwest. In recognition of Black History Month, MET hosted Rukaya Adams in our webinar, The Civil Rights Movement, Challenges and Realities of Yesterday and Today. Ms. Adams reflected on the connection between our history and our present and how we can move forward as a society towards becoming more loving, more accepting, and more inclusive. In celebration of Women's History Month, MET hosted Dr. Aziza Elhibri, Commissioner Nafisa Fai, Washington County Administrator Tanya Angie, and Latricia Tillman, Washington County's Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer, in a webinar titled, Choose to Challenge, the Changing Face of Leadership, in which the panelists discussed the role of Muslim women leaders in our continued fight against bigotry and hatred, MET addressed the Islamophobic comments of Commissioner Mark Scholl and in a press conference advocated for communal healing. In September of 2020, MET partnered with the Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center to provide free COVID-19 health screenings. Finally, in March of 2021, the Muslim Educational Trust, in partnership with Multnomah and Washington counties, became one of the few Muslim organizations in the United States to offer on-site COVID-19 vaccinations. 529 community members, primarily from refugee and immigrant communities, received COVID-19 vaccines. The Vaccination Center was a crowning achievement for the Muslim Educational Trust following 27 years of forming partnerships, seeking collaboration, and community building. Though the past year has been extremely challenging, God Most Gracious has also blessed us with the opportunity to be of service to others, to bring communities together, to help heal and unify. MET gives thanks to God Most High and thanks to each individual, organization, city, and county that has made our work possible. Thank you for your continued support of the Muslim Educational Trust. Good evening, everybody. My name is J.W. Matt Hennessy, and I'm the pastor of historic Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church. I also serve as co-chair of the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, and I'm grateful to be with you tonight. I'm also grateful for the Muslim Educational Trust, grateful for the staff and leadership at MET, and really the wonderful way that MET shows up in the public square. If it was not for MET and the great work that is being done here, we would not have the voice that has been so important in social issues and social justice if it were not for you. And I wanna say thank you for all the great work that you do because we are determined to rid this region of hate, Islamophobia in particular, and we're determined to make sure that all of us work together as brothers and sisters, learn to understand one another listen to one another in a way that we will take good, humane action and that we will be an example to other cities and other regions about how to work together. So I just want to say tonight on my personal behalf, on behalf of my family and my church, and on behalf of EMO, thank you, MET, 
for being who you are. Let us keep working together. And with that, I really want to ask each one of you to please give and contribute to the continued cause of humanity and the continued cause of the mission of the Muslim Educational Trust. I'm grateful personally, and I'm grateful because you will feel that you have made one of the best contributions ever. Many of you have contributed every year, like I have. I beg you, do that again this year. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Um, it is my honor to introduce Judge Kasabai, but before I do that, I want to congratulate all the graduates and their parents here today um, on the, your success and your achievement. Congratulations on behalf of MET, the teachers, and everybody who has helped you come here to this successful moment. Uh, Judge Kasabai is um, currently a federal magistrate judge at United States District Court for the District of Oregon. Judge Kasabai was born in Los Angeles, California in 1970. His parents are Indian Muslim immigrants having moved to the United States from Mumbai in 1960s. Kasabai graduated from the University of California, Berkeley in 1992 with a degree in business administration. He completed his Juris Doctorate degree at the University of Oregon School of Law in 1996, where he served as an associate direct editor on the Oregon Law Review as a graduate teaching fellow for the University of Oregon and a president of the Student Bar Association. Kasabai began his private legal career in small civil plaintiff's firm until he opened his own practice, the law office of Musafa T. Kasabai, serving a wide geographic area including rural communities representing workers and unions in workers' compensation cases and plaintiffs in civil cases primarily involving torts and work-related injuries. In 2003, then-Governor Ted Polanski nominated Kasabai to serve on the Oregon Workers' Compensation Board as one of its labor members. In 2007, George, Governor Kalanski appointed Kasabai as a judge on the Lane County Circuit Court. He was re-elected to another six-year term in 2014. Kasaboy was selected to join the federal bench in uh, September 2018 from a pool of more than 50 applicants. Kasaboy is the first Muslim American to serve on the federal bench in the United States and was the first South Asian American and Muslim American judge to be appointed to the Lane County Circuit Court. Everyone, please welcome Judge Kasaboy. Assalamu alaikum. It is, it is a beautiful sight to stand here and see all of you. As you might uh, have heard or know from Sister Joyra's uh, introduction, I live in Eugene, and so the level of diversity and the beautiful faces from so many countries is something for me to treasure today. To witness the beautiful community, the Ummah, of our Islamic community brought together by the Muslim Educational Trust. This is a celebration for me, and somewhat selfishly, because I get a chance to be among all of you. And with the gratitude Brother Wajdi invited me to share some thoughts for the keynote address to also celebrate the graduation of the class of 2021. So congratulations, the class of 2021. And Mubarak. 
I can't tell you how proud it is to see an Islamic academy thrive in the way that the Muslim Educational Trust and OIA have done here in Oregon. What MET and the OIA have accomplished is to bring us from outside and on the edge of our society and our communities to the inside so that we can participate actively and normally in every aspect of our communities throughout the United States. That is a powerful accomplishment to be present and not unusual. To be active and engaged and have every right to do so. OIA is making it sure that when Muslims are not present in the room, it will become an unusual occurrence. The absence will be noticed. And that is a goal and an objective that OIA is steadily accomplishing with every single graduate that comes to me. How many parents are in the room and family members that will take responsibility for having helped their young ones graduate today? Please raise your hand. There must be more. Thank you for making sure they have an opportunity to attend school here. And for all the young people who have graduated today, please make sure that you look to your left, your right, behind, and in front, and know that there are many people who help carry you through these many years. I open my comments today with a poem from Khalil Gibran, and it is dedicated to the parents in the room. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts. For they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward nor tarries to yesterday. You, O oh parents, you are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. O oh, parents, let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies true, so he loves also the bow that is stable. I struggle with that as a parent every day myself, and I am reminded that I am only a steward on this short time. And I dedicate, as I've mentioned, to all the parents in the room, but I also want to encourage every single one, including the students here, that you also play a role as a bow in the creation of your own life and the choices that you make. And it is in that theme that I want to share some thoughts about the imagery that has been presented in the annual report and that Brother Tawad had also described about the amazing things that have been accomplished here in the community from around the world, the people
people that we represent and that we come together, not just as a singular identity, but that singularity is found in the multitude of all of the beautiful faces that are here today. But first, a confession. As a lawyer and a judge, I tend to be melancholic, and so I tend to start with some serious things. So please bear with me, even in the celebration of today's graduation, I share an antithesis. Now, I'm sure you've studied Greek mythology in the course of your studies. And there is a story, a story of Narcissus. Perhaps you might remember this story. And it goes something like this. There was a river spirit who had a child with a woodland spirit. Their child was exquisitely beautiful, the most beautiful in the land. And as that child roamed the woods, many spirits, and even humans, fell deeply in love with the beauty of that young person. And yet, that child, that young man, spurned every single one with the conclusion that no one was good enough for him. And so as it happens in these ancient Greek myths, the gods of the Greeks would often feel less redemptive and forgiving and would want to curse him. And so they did with him for his arrogance. And as he comes across the pond as he's traveling in the woods, he falls to take a drink. And he sees for the first time his own reflection and his frozen in his mind. As he sees his reflection, he falls deeply in love with what he sees, wanting so badly and yet unattainable. And he stares for all eternity. He cannot bear to be disturbed in this vision of himself. And so he ensures that no one can come close to this pond, not even for refreshment or sustenance. He sees only his reflection and finds a way. I offer this idea as our antithesis today, and that is, Narcissus is the embodiment of privilege, the wrong kind of privilege. The privilege that excludes, a privilege that has an affinity for only those whose identities are similar to their own. In fact, they care less about other people if they think of other people at all. They are blind to others. They prevent other people from coming to the pond to drink water because it is their pond. Narcissus and others like them are also emotionally fragile. And one of the biggest criteria or characteristics of those with privilege simply want to reproduce others in their own image. I'd like to think of privilege as a curse, and certainly the capacity, at least, to be one. The resolution. For me, as I mentioned, as a, as a judge, I'm, I'm regularly consumed with the idea of community in the context of justice and fairness and equity. I think about it every day. I can't walk away from most days ever thinking or not thinking about how I'm doing my work with that ideal of fairness and justice. That which moves me is searching for the commonality and honoring our differences, no matter how similar we might also find ourselves to be. To do this kind of work, the work that is opposed to privilege, like that of narcissists. The work that brings people together in equity and justice needs a spirit. 
and needs a spiritual solution for it to be enduring. And in that spirit, I want to share a verse from the Holy Quran that reflects how I see what needs to be done. It is from Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa anthaya wa ja'alnakum sha'uba wa kaba'a ila lita'arafu. O humankind, as I understand this might be translated, we have created from you from a male and female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another and not despise one another. Now, as you can tell from my uh, broken recitation in Arabic, I am not a religious scholar, but one who attempts to find meaning where I can, and there is much wisdom in this ayah for me and particularly the work that I get to do as a judge. In this verse, in this ayat, I find that there is an identification, a confirmation that we are from a common humanity as we are dressed as all of humankind. And while we have made you into different nations and tribes, I note that it, is not, it does not name any one nation or tribe above another. And so that we might know one another. I appreciate that knowing, not just as a state of awareness, but also as the act of striving for knowledge of one another. It does not say that we might dominate one another, to be superior over one another, for one nation over tribe to rule over, over others, but to know one another. Imagine the opposite. If we were all the same instead, if we were not made into the nations and tribes to know one another, if we were all the same color, we spoke all the same language, we shared all the same traditions, I submit that we would lose the capacity to reflect, the capacity to know ourselves. And so in that ayat, I also note that the power of knowing one another can only come from knowing ourselves too. The failure to reflect is one of the first steps to losing our spirit, our compassion, and our community and accepting the diversity within ourselves. And when I say ourselves, individually ourselves, because we are not just one person with one name, with one idea of who we are as an individual, but that we reflect an individuality that is multifaceted. To know yourself in all those ways can also make sure that we can know each other in all those ways. I want to share with you another poem. And it is uh, from our own Oregon's Poet Laureate, Edwin Markham. I saw it once when a friend shared it with me and I wrote it down and I taped it to my desk so I could be reminded of this simple message. He drew a circle that shut me out, a heretic, a rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. I share this poem because it captures the essence of what I was just referring to in knowing one another. It captures the essence of justice and equity in the work that I do in the civil arena. Now, the definition of justice by no means might capture poetry, 
or speak in other lofty, deep spiritual terms. Unfortunately, justice in many secular arenas, in particular government, can all too easily be sterilized to generally mean the administration of the law, conformity to the law, rightness, or even self-righteousness. But these notions don't do justice to justice. The heart and soul of justice comes from people who give of themselves to bring equity into our communities, to everyone. I was moved to share these ideas in large part because of the incredible interrogation that I experienced from the public square a few months ago from the students who graduate today and from the other, class, uh, the other classes. It was evident in how you approached the law and the interrogation of a judge, which I won't ever forget. I've taken names. It, it, it was clear to me that the students from OIA are committed to this ideal of pursuing justice and equity. Maybe as judges, maybe as lawyers and doctors and artists and poets and writers, wherever it may be, you are passionate about those things. Through your passion for justice and your commitment to equity, class of 2021, you, we all can keep drawing that circle wider and hopefully one day include everyone. This also means that you can't be on the sidelines. And I know you know that. So how do you do this? There are many ways, but I offer three, three ideas. First, appreciation and a knowledge conviction that the world is wide enough for you and me. Now, this is where I might get into trouble with Sister Joyra. I'm going to cite the first law of thermodynamics. Is, this, is Sister Joyra? Uh, thank you. So you're going to tell me if I'm wrong? <laughs> All right. The first law of thermodynamics does not apply to human relationships. Now, the law states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Am I right? Beautiful. All right. All right. You know, sometimes lawyers and judges like to talk a lot, but we might not always know what we're talking about. We might just sound like we know what we're talking about. So this time, I was trying to do my research to get it right. Now, that law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is finite when it comes to human relationships and when it comes to the spirit. The quantity of energy does not stay the same. It does not, that law does not apply to human relationships. People act, though, as if it does every day. When we strive for equity, however, when we strive to make space for others at the table, when we materially acknowledge another's dignity, we create more energy in the world. We create more matter in equity. Never believe, please, that our human relationships and the love that you bring is a scarce resource. Privilege, on the other hand, derives its power from the belief in scarcity. Scarcity of money, the natural resources, food, and power itself. The desire to control it drives privilege. Equity. Justice rejects that model of scarcity and instead is committed to the idea that your voice does not need to deprive me of mine. Equity also subscribes to the ideal that dignity is the foundational currency of our human relationships. And that currency can be printed ad infinitum. I need not deprive another of her dignity to preserve mine. If we accept scarcity is true, then we will exclude others as we have been excluded. Second theme. 
Learning to let go. Teach them how to say goodbye. Be the bow. Now, I'm going to refer to history. I'm moving away from science because that's all I had, and I'm not going to try anymore. President George Washington, in his farewell address, pre uh, preserved our democracy, not because he became king. And for all the flaws that might be evident in our founding fathers, I'm profoundly awed by what President Washington did in exercising the strength to let go of his power. And as he did so, he knew a government founded on his or anyone else's singular personality would utterly fail. So too with the pursuit of equity. Privilege does not recognize that. If you make the movement, or if you think you make the movement, then the movement is weakened. So what are we doing every day to ensure that we can pass on our access, our privilege, our power, so that our work can continue, not just us. It does no good to be buried with that power. Unshared power, hoarded power, is like the heart refusing to beat. Or a stagnant pond that has become unhealthy, unhealthy and lifeless compared to the rolling rivers always changing, dynamic, and forceful. And as I am moving a little bit slower in my speech, I'll refer to something that might be evident in everyone's belly, hunger. The other reference would be like a hot potato. Ah, potatoes might not be that enticing at the moment. But a hot potato, you hold it long enough, you'll burn. And if you refuse to pass it on, you fail to warm others. The power to give away is the power to renew and to become something greater than yourself by letting others take on the mantle. The last and final theme is that none of the other two can actually happen without humility and the practice of that humility every day. The practice and commitment to be active, an active part of a larger whole, is that kind of humility. One need not do great things as long as what you do is infused with love. One need, and in fact, that makes the thing great. One need not do big things if it is just for yourself. In fact, the smallest of things can have great power. All right, Sister Joera, I couldn't resist another scientific uh, reference. The power of an atom, when leveraged appropriately, has some of the most amazing power that can be released. In the absence of humility, justice can be no more than revenge. In the presence of humility, mercy flourishes. And I'm reminded of an, a hadith in which someone asked of the Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah to curse, to pray a curse upon others who are giving them difficulty. And his response was, I was not sent to be a curse, but a mercy. It is in that humility that we can find our strength as a community. While humility is often invoked as the lifeblood of our democracy and justice, society often abandons itself for self-interest. Yet how many civilizations have pursued that self-interest and have since disappeared from history? How many monuments celebrating that self-interest have crumbled and have been forgotten? 
Instead, what a world we might create if we chose to be completely present for our children, our friends and neighbors. What might it mean to courageously give one's lifetime to redeem even just one person's life? Do not great things, but do things with love. Humility calls on us to pursue this kind of good. Humility asks us to embrace the truth that if we are not constantly struggling, struggling to widen that circle, perhaps we also don't deserve to be in it. Justice requires this kind of humility. So what does it look like when we cross the finish line? Class of 2021, there is no finish line. But celebrate today because it is a huge, huge accomplishment. But know that there is no finish line. The striving of justice and equity and the building of community that is not just one size fits all is the goal that will constantly and always change. There will be an unending number of people that deserve to be at the table. There are voices that you and I cannot even imagine that do or will exist. How can we say we've reached anywhere when not everybody that will ever exist has been able to come to the table? The goal is to keep making room. So in the spirit of hope, and I know because I just told you that it was kind of despairing that it's never going to end, uh, I'd like to close with an image of how equity and justice might be imagined. Imagine a rough stone dug out from deep within the earth. Polish just one edge and shine a light on it. Not much to look at. Uh, but then go polish an edge and another and another next to each other at angles. Keep cutting and polishing these facets and these edges. Now each facet is sharing an edge with multitudes of others. And I look out at this room, I see facets sharing edges with each of us today. My friends, pursuing equity is like shaping a diamond without end. Every facet is an intersection of our shared identities. After all, if we were all just one flat surface, we could not shine. Each facet is not only an intersection of each of us, but imagine each facet an intersection of all of you individually. Every facet, an, interconnect, an interconnected group, deserves to be heard and seen. And when one facet, one of us captures the light, what happens in that beautiful diamond we are making? It reflects through the entire whole. It is only through that selflessness that the diamond can shine and shimmer brilliantly. That's the justice and the equity that I heard in the questions that you posed to me in the public square. That is the passion and commitment to finding yourselves in a larger community that I heard today in the description of Brother Jawad, Jawad from Marx, and is evident in MET's vision that is described in that annual report. MET and OAI, OIA are beautiful diamonds. Each and every one of you are too. Brothers and sisters, be the bow. 
that sets the dreams of your arrows forward and do it with gladness. Draw the circle wider and never stop drawing. Flow like the river, never be that stagnant pond. And all of you, shine like diamonds. Wassalam. Salma, can you, uh, Salma Sheikh, can you come and join me, please? I want you to recognize uh, Judge Kasabai with a gift. Salma, please join me, please. Salma is a sophomore in Oregon Islamic Academy, and hopefully she'll be studying law, and she wants to be like you. And she's the one that gave you the hard time, Judge, with all the questions, you know. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause to Salma Sheikh for her courage. Just to run a disclaimer, this is an olive oil from Palestine. The book? Read it, just the title. Okay. Um, this book is by Linda Sarsour, and Speak it's, up. Uh, we are not here to be bystanders by Linda Sarsour. <laughs> Just Kasubai, may Allah bless you and reward you for being available for us all the time and for your advices and for all of the above. By the way, we, uh, me and Judge Kasubai, we share that his grandmother, born in Yemen, and they migrated to India in 900. So may Allah bless you, Judge Kasubai. Let's give round applause again to Judge Kasubai. I would kindly ask uh, Dr. Joy C to join me. She's the homeroom teacher for eighth grade to give the diplomas for each of the students. <laughs> Salma Raj Abdi. Salma.
Is she here? Is Selma here? Where is Selma? Can you join me, please? Salah Robina Adam. Salah, would you please join us? Rama Tahseen Al Khatib, she's not here. Rama Tahseen Al Khatib. Bilal Abu Bakr Basharo. Bilal. Faisa Ghassan bin Humam. Congratulations, Faisa. Mubarak. Amin Farah Zahir. Please join us. Congratulations, Amir Mubarak. Congratulations, Amir. Amina Al Walid Al Zain. وجدان رمضان نشتاوي Another great judge, Judge Kasubhai in the making. وجدان مبارك إن شاء الله. يرحب جلوك لك تيشا مريم. تيشا مريم مريم. Thank you. مريم مرواز حكيمي. Maryam, her first year with us this year, and hopefully she will finish our high school program. What a blessing to have. Shaista Mir Hussein. It's her first year here. Inshallah, she will continue with us in high school. <laughs> Ayub Ahmed Muhammad. Amina Muhammad Chawi.
Amina is in Africa. Abdurrahman Min Tor. May Allah bless them in behalf of our in behalf of our board of trustees and board of directors, may Allah bless them. And all of them are joining us into the high school program, the Oregon Islamic Academy. This is, will be the biggest class to graduate, inshallah, in 2025. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you and reward you. This is a very solid class. Most of them are scientists and some are good in language arts. So we will have a combination of doctors and engineers and lawyers. May Allah bless you. Congratulations. Takbir. This class has the largest Afghan American students, you know, and most of them are from the same tribe. They are Bakhtun, you know. Congratulations, you know. It's with great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Julie Ahmed to introduce Julie is our teacher for language art and uh, social studies and speech and debate. <laughs> Sister Julie will be introducing Sister Julie will be introducing our second keynote speaker, last but not least, Brother Polo Catalani. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It is a great honor to introduce our next keynote speaker on this very special occasion of eighth grade graduation and high school graduation, Brother Renault, a.k.a. Pak Palo Catalani, was born in Indonesia. He identifies with both Catalan and Manado ethnicities and heritage. Paulo spent his early childhood living in Indonesia until he and his family moved to the Netherlands due to civil strife. Paulo lived in the Netherlands for six years where he began school. In 1966, his family moved to Salem, Oregon as church-sponsored refugees. In 1972, Paulo was drafted by the U.S. Army. So he sought asylum with his grandfather in the Netherlands in order to not be sent back to the turmoil in Asia from where he escaped. Once the draft ended, Paulo returned to Salem. He then began attending the University of Oregon on an athletic scholarship and received his bachelor's degrees in political science, psychology, and philosophy. I'm happy to see that the Oregon Ducks are well represented tonight. Returning to Salem, he, rece he received his doctorate in law, followed by his postdoc in community lawyering at Howard University in DC. Using his education, Paulo started organizing minority communities in Salem and then moved his practice to Portland. He partnered with mutual assistance associations and the government in order to establish ERCO in 1986. Currently, he serves as a board member for both the Asian Family Center and ERCO. He is also the founding executive director of New Portland Foundation and a creative writing teacher here at Oregon Islamic Academy. His current duties include civic engagement, fundraising, finding future partners, and facilitating relationships between the government and immigrant communities through positive integration program. 
Please welcome Brother Polo. Uh, don't be afraid, I am uh, double vaccinated and double COVID tested. And our daughter is a public health doctor, a very cool job to have these days, and she gets me these very cool masks. She told me to tell you to not be afraid. And I think this is what I would like to talk to you about um, rather rapidly tonight, because I know how hungry you are. I can hear your tummies from clear up here. It's the problem of fear, the problem of America's fear. And here comes the hard part, graduates. We're kind of leaving this job of getting America out of our fear and out of our anger to you. As you've heard Judge Mustafa say over and over again, we don't need to burden you terribly. You're supposed to be celebrating eating too much, laughing too much, crying too much tonight. But pretty soon, you have a huge burden ahead of you. It's the work that started here at Oregon Islamic Academy. It will be your work for your entire life. I am now 68 years old, almost. Alhamdulillah, 50 years ago, I graduated. No, I didn't graduate. To be truthful, I finished high school in Salem, Oregon. Uh, I was one of those kids teachers passed on year after year because we learn in our home, in our homelands, how to be polite. So I politely said nothing for six years of education in America and I kept getting passed. I could not write a paragraph. I still cannot do math, but I'm a polite guy. Uh, as uh, uh, teacher Julia was uh, explaining earlier, uh, there was this draft, and <laughs> my pa decided that I cannot go fight in a war we just left. Uh, so he sent us to my grandpa's house in the Netherlands. I came back, and luckily I had been in, uh, an athlete in international and national competition since I was very small. We learned how to fight while I grow up. So judo and jujitsu and boxing is how we graduated from our neighborhoods. Great skill back home and not such a great skill in America. I'm telling you this because back then, the United States of America had warred 10 times in faraway places, sending American boys and men to war on families, on your families or families just like yours and mine. Those American boys and men returned to America wounded deeply. They are so afraid, they are so angry, they don't even know what they're angry about, but they are filled with fear and remorse. They are as wounded as your parents and mine for the destruction they did to our homelands. Now, this many years later, America has warred 16 times since our family came here. You cannot have a nation sowing that much bitterness, sowing that much sorrow, and then bringing it all back here and expect this to be a healthy, happy country. So seniors, as you're leaving this place, this place where these teachers listen to you quietly, thought deeply, and taught you lovingly, this is what we need for you to do when you leave university four years, seven years, eight years from now. Fifty years ago, I walked into university, you know, I didn't know what a midterm final was. I had no social security number. I'd never been on university. I didn't know what to do. Luckily, I had other athletes to hang out with, and one of them was a Japanese student grew up like me with combat arts, and we were the best buds. And we shared one rice cooker between the two of us because we were not going to be fed at American universities the way we were used to. That's okay. I'm not complaining. 
I am saying that I found a professor, or he found me, and he was my uncle professor. I'm saying this to you because if you find those anti-professors or those uncle professors at university and show them your sincerity, show them your gratitude and humbleness, like your parents, your grandparents, like these teachers, your elders and ancestors have taught you, you are well on your way. This professor, during my undergraduate times, now mind you, I could not write a paragraph, sent me into, well, he sent me to Egypt first, to American University in Cairo, and then on to Khartoum, and then I went to Asmara as Ethiopian and uh, Tigray and uh, uh, I cannot remember the other nationalities in Ethiopia, uh, were running this way. I was running into that disaster to do research. He sent me to Delhi University to study the great migration of India when Hindus and Muslims had to pass each other on the road, millions and millions of sorrowing, struggling grandpas and grandmas, and baby boys and girls and the parents in between, as the British saw, to move people from one place to another. That professor sent me in my master's work to Thailand to watch the results of American warring in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And here we have again these huge movements of people in great pain, leaving their country the way our families left our countries trading places, coming to America with our pain, with our sorrow. This needs to end, and I'm afraid to say it's kind of your job to have it end. I'm at 50 years of working and trying and trying and trying my best to work with my hands every single day because I had the blessing of going back home to see the sorrow firsthand. Now, many of students in the class I teach here have gone back home, have gone to Srebrenica, have gone back to Ethiopia, to Somalia, to Kenya, to feel their elders and their ancestors, their parents' pain. This is the first step to healing yourselves, is to not have that rage, that sorrow, that bewilderment, be in your bones guiding how you live and how you love. We need to settle that. We need to heal ourselves before we can heal the rest of America. Mind you, America is waiting for us to heal us. It's a big job. Good luck with that. But if you think for a moment, uh, we call her Binti Manis Kami, daughter, dear, ours, Malala, Six years ago, as a 15-year-old, was shot in the head by a man, another Afghani, who didn't want her and sisters like her, daughters like her, to go to school. People listened to Malala, who's now 21 years old. People listen to her and learn from her because she listens quietly. She thinks deep and she teaches lovingly. Why is she not angry? Why is she not full of rage? If you come from my world, the world of Muhammad Ali, the champion of the world, that man refused to fight in Vietnam. He refused to be drafted into the army because he said, I don't hate Vietnamese grandmas and grandpas, uncles and Buddha, baby, Buddha belly baby boys. I have no anger against them. Why should I go over there? and hurt them. They did nothing to me. We listen, we learn from Muhammad Ali. Of course he's a great boxer, but he's a man of great conscience because he refused to let the bitterness, the anger that runs so much of this otherwise creative and kind nation, we are run by anger and by bitterness. We have just passed four years of left bitterness, right bitterness. Let's all get in and argue with each other as if that kind of anger, as if that kind of sorrow is going to make us any healthier. Will not. So you, dear students, 
alhamdulillah. To your parents, to our teachers, to our administrators, to our ummah, for loving you and letting you grow up with this great generosity in this grand new continent. And may this grandness, this generosity that you've seen from your teachers on stage, um, from uh, Um Wajdi Said, and from a uh, teacher, um, I can't remember the Gujarati's name, Jawat, and the other Gujarati, <laughs> uh, Judge Mustafa, uh, uh, Dr. Julie and Dr. Juria, let their kindness, their patience, their quiet, their teaching you lovingly be how you proceed in these next 50 years so you can come back here and celebrate with us 50 years from now. Masalamah and uh, salamat jala. And may your, your journey be peace. I was hoping for a Ford uh, F-250 pickup, but I guess I may have to settle for less. Uh, Brother Polo, may Allah bless you and reward you. You have been part of my life for 33 years here in Portland. And Polo will be recognized by our uh, upcoming senior, Bahar Madani, an Iranian-American. Me and Polo are uh, vaccinated in the same day, so we are brothers of vaccination, you know. So, uh, can I say this? You know what is a great joy with, with working with Brother Wajdi is we trade roles. Sometimes he's the mean guy and I'm the <laughs> nice guy. Other times he's the nasty guy and I'm the, no, I'm the nasty guy and he's the nice guy. Tell no one. <laughs> we can change roles like this in a flash. So, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Brother Polo. Let's give him a round of applause. May Allah bless him. Somebody is giving us instruction behind the scenes, so we need to recognize the eighth grade uh, speech tournament, I believe. Huh? Salma Abdi, second place in Imprompt Speech Tournament at the Oregon Islamic Academy. <laughs> Teacher Julie, can you join please, since you are the speech tournament uh, and speech and debate teacher. It's all sanitized. And Faiza bin Humam. Third place in Imprompt. I mean, Bahar in the third place in elocution. I mean, Omnia Azain, first place in elocution. Wujdan Ishtewi, second place in unprompt. Maryam Hakimi, first place in unprompt. like men are endangered species in this tournament, you know. Ayub Muhammad, second place. Come to. Takbir for Ayub. He's the only gentleman, huh? <laughs> Who? Who? Oh, I mean, yeah, two of you. May Allah bless you, inshallah. 
This is really a very interesting uh, class, and very strong, and very loving, and very caring, and very charismatic. Third place, eighth grade, Wijdan Shtoui. Science Fair. Takbir. <laughs> Do you want to come? Or that's it? That's the only one? Okay. So we'll show the video for uh, our 12th grade. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <Now lovely. laughs>
I think MET's subjects have really benefited me because while you still have the basics such as English and, English and math, you can always go back and you'll find that you have also Islamic studies and Arabic and Quran and those are really good to teach you the Islamic history. And you've also got other things such as speech and debate where you learn to talk in like a more natural sense. I found um, a community at MET. Um, it's given me like a Muslim community and a Somali community which I need for because you know I'm so being Somali is a big part of my personality and I think that finding a community is really important and MET has that community both a Muslim and Somali community and especially after moving from Virginia to Oregon it's been like a big move and you know like that I have to like restart my whole life so like coming to MET has given me that community that I'm looking for. YA means a lot to me. I've been here for four years and basically changed my whole entire life. I remember first coming here, not being mature, playing around, messing around, and I regret not like first coming and taking things seriously. I took things seriously in 11th grade and I regret that. Well, Muslim Educational Trust and specifically Oregon Islam Academy have a big part in my life. Ever since I was a little kid, growing up in public school till about 8th grade, I didn't necessarily build my Muslim identity as much as I wanted to. So once I joined Oregon Islam Academy and the Greater Muslim Educational Trust, I feel like those four years where I spent learning as well as volunteering and building community relations helped me identify as a Muslim rather than just a normal American citizen. So my fondest memory from the Oregon Islam Academy is probably my first ever fundraiser. When I, when I came, I, I remember coming in with a pretty weird haircut. I had gotten rid of all my hair, and so when I first came in, a lot of people didn't notice me. And I remember a couple of my friends looked at me like, who is this? And then finally, once they understood it was me, it was just a great time in general because it was the, it was the first kind of uh, experience I had with the MET fundraiser specifically. I mean, like the big MET events because there's a, there's a different vibe, as you would say, with the big MET events than there are with the potlucks or even just class in general with MET because everyone's kind of trying to get everything done, everything's organized in a manner, and as, as always in MET fashion, something goes wrong and things don't always go to plan, so you have to be able to quick, uh, quickly think on your feet and be able to make sure that things run smoothly even though there's a roadblock up ahead. The most memorable thing, I think we can all agree, uh, let me start with this. Whenever we remember things, it's usually in our childhood, when we're young. Those are the most impactful things, so that's what brings us up. Here, it would definitely be, I was in fourth grade, um, middle of the year, we were still in those small little houses, small little shacks, decks, whatever you want to call them. And it was just this big rock in the, in the massive field, a rock in the middle of it. Every lunch recess, every snack recess, my friends and I, we would just go at it digging up the rock, acting like paleontologists trying to dig up the bones. Um, and this went on for a week, week or two. And it just showed how dedicated we were to get that rock out, that inner MET dedication that we had. And I mean, in the end, uh, a teacher came and dug it out with a shovel, but hey, it was an experience. We definitely remember that. I can guarantee you a lot of the classmates can remember that too. Oregon Islamic Academy is, what I've, is where I was born. It's what I was raised in. It's my second home. Some could say it was my first home. It really means to, I'll give an example. I have my mother, I have my father, and then I have my third guardian. My third guardian would definitely be the teachers, the staff, all my older siblings and brothers in Oregon Islamic Academy. They've been there through the thin of things. They've been there whenever I needed help, academic, physical, mental help. They've always been there for me. And I feel that Oregon Islamic Academy definitely provided that home environment for me where I could be myself, show my personality, give off emotion. Uh, well, personally, Oregon Islamic Academy has been the uh, type of school that's really built me up to the person I am right now. Uh, it's made me a good model student. It's made me a good person in general. It's also helped me establish a lot of, you know, main questions that I had about myself and, you know, who I am because it really helped keep my identity intact. It's also a place where I kind of felt like, you know, my second home as well, you know, having a lot of 
friends who I knew from such a young age to teachers and faculty that I've been associating myself with ever since you know middle school up until right now, which I've been graduating. So Oregon STEM Academy means a lot to me, and it helped me really uh, develop in different ways that I wouldn't imagine I could in another place. Oregon STEM Academy is like a home to me. It's not only a place of learning, it's not only an educational center, it's not only an institution. I've grown here as a person, Islamically, educationally, and it's a very comforting environment. In the Quran and Islam, we are encouraged to do critical thinking, and an ayah that reflects this in the Quran is "Alladin yathkurun Allah qiyama wa qurda wa ala junubihim, wa yatafakkaroon fi khalq al-samawat wal ard. Rabbana ma khalqta hada baatilan subhanak faqin aadab al nar." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us to ponder upon His creation and be critical thinkers, and. This ayah encourages us all as Muslims and this ayah has personally also inspired me to take critical thinking not only, not only educationally but Islamically also. Oregon Islamic Academy and MET in general means so much to me as it has become one of the most important things about my life. Like when I go to a different place and I think of home, MET is one of the things that I think of. And it's one of the core things that I think of, especially because of the people and the experiences that I've had here. And they're just so special to me because of how authentic and how real and how genuine everyone is here. Well, MET has had a huge impact on my life, especially because it has been like a second home to me because, and sometimes it even feels like a first home because of how many hours I've spent here. But MET is extremely important to me as I have learned some of the key lessons in my life through MET and through some of these classes. Like for example, speech and debate. I have learned how to articulate my words and to argue in a manner that is respectful and um, with using logic and through ethos, pathos, logos. Using these things that you learn in class to be able to use them while you're outside of the class and outside of school. And then for example, like Arabic class. I've been able to use Arabic class in a way to help me connect with my relatives more and connect with those who speak Arabic only and have a harder time speaking English like for example when they come into MET and they need some assistance with where they need to go. Well, to me, my closest community, the one that believes in me before anybody else before any other commu community gave me a chance, it was this one right here. It was MET. Walking in here in fifth grade, when I shouldn't have been at the school, um, and trying as hard as I could to prove myself, and not being able to, and tripping and falling on my face continuously over and over again, I realized that adversity is what makes a person, not your successes not how well you do something, but the lessons you learn from when you trip and fall or when you don't succeed, when you fail. Those failures are your biggest lessons. And so, just like everybody else, we've all failed, we've all seen failure. But who is there to dust you off and pick you up right after you fail? Who did that for you? The people that dusted you off and picked you up those are the ones that deserve your kindness and your support later on in the future. And this place made me who I am today. Inshallah, I will come back and either lead it or I'll work in the background to bolster it and make it become a place of compassion and love and Islam and a beacon of light not only for our Muslim Ummah here in the United States, not only for our Muslim Ummah worldwide, but for all humanity. And in doing so, we can help our entire Ummah all over the world become a beacon of light as well. In doing that, I want to be able to represent my people on a political stage, represent my people in nonprofits, um, help them find economic stability, find familial love, find that this place is to their home. This place is their home.
Don't be intimidated. It seems difficult. It seems impossible. Some nights you think, I'm not gonna get through this. I'm not gonna turn this essay in. I'm not gonna complete this lab. I'm not gonna do this homework. I can't do it. But you can. And you will. And you will succeed. There's nothing intimidating about MET. It's rigorous. That's not a lie. It's difficult. It's not a lie. But it pushes you. It challenges you. It makes you the person that you want to be. And without that, then we would all be at loss. And also, you should try to push your boundaries. Try to put out your wings and try to fly. Try to be your own person. And MET is a welcoming and loving environment to the point where when you do put your wings out and fly, when you do want to soar and be your own person, all the teachers here, all the leaders here, all the staff here is ready to bolster you up, pick you up, and help you fly. They're not going to drag you down. They're not going to make you think the way they want you to think. And all those traditional ideas that you might have of a teacher or an elder, etc., etc., they're not true here. They all disappear. It's about love and compassion and helping you grow to the best person you can be. It's with great honor and pleasure to introduce you to my beloved Mustafa Rashid. Mustafa has been with us for 13 years. He's one of the unique individuals that you meet in your life. You know, Mustafa is like my spiritual adopted son. Mustafa never failed us down. Only one time he failed me. I got a proposal about seven years ago to uh, have mochi, Japanese ice cream, you know. I was the first one to be offered this, and Mustafa was to be an investor. And the last minute, he changed his mind. <laughs> but Mustafa, may Allah bless him, he's one of the few, or the only student that you see in the donor's tree that he invested, and he bought his first square feet you know, as an endowment. May Allah bless you, Mustafa. May Allah make you better than what you think about you. We're gonna miss you. You know, he used to, when I used to travel a lot for business, he will always, when I'm moist, he will be coming back. His mother can testify that. He was the only one of the students that will ask, where is this and where is that and where is I'm moist? Mustafa, we are proud of you today. You were chosen today to give the speech for your class because you are the longest and it's a big class and I'm sure you will great uh, substance and wherever you go, we love you and we care about you. You have that personality that you reflected in your thesis, justice and mercy. All the staff that we made the decision always say that about Mustafa. Each one of their classmates are wonderful and great, but Mustafa has been a veteran in our school system. May Allah bless you, Mustafa. Without further delay, let's give Mustafa a big round of applause. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Many of you might already know me, but my name is Mustafa Rashid, or some people might know me as Rania's son. But I've had the opportunity to spend the last 13 years of my life at MET. So many experiences I've had have reflected on the person I am today, and there's no way to truly put everything together that MET has done for me. Everyone here, from the teachers, to the parents, to the students, everyone has shaped the way I am today. Even the guests that would come in to take tours during classes. The teachers, although I might have been a tough student sometimes because you might have to be patient with me, they have been very patient and they have taught me everything I know. 
whether it is how to speak, how to write, how to read, and they've even taught me how to formulate my many thoughts into words that make sense to others. With all this being said, on behalf of my classmates, I'd like to thank all of the teachers. Thank all of you for all the work you guys have done, all the countless hours you guys have spent grading our homework assignments, staying up late to respond to our last minute emails. Everything that you guys have done for us has shaped us into the people that we are today. And I think everyone in my class agrees with that. There's a story that always stuck with me when I was in middle school. There was an assignment that I had, and the guidelines were pretty clear, but I did not read the instructions very well. So I turned in the assignment, and I ended up getting a zero. <laughs> My dad saw this, and he must have been thinking, oh no, not again. But with all jokes aside, he made sure that I redid the assignment. And he told me that even if you don't get another score, even if you keep a zero, the lesson is to make sure you read your instructions. I was pleased to see that my grade had changed to a full score, but it was just the, the lesson that I learned from the teacher and from my dad that really emphasized the lessons that you can learn at the school. It's not only just a school where you go in, you do your grades, you leave, and that's it. You know, you learn life lessons here and you learn how to become a better human and a better Muslim. The school has taught me many things such as the word Weltanschauung, which is my worldview. Teacher Duad gave a little spoiler earlier, but it's okay. And my worldview has changed, especially since coming here. I mean, all I've known is the school since I've been here since kindergarten. But the worldview that, I have been, that has been given to me and that I have fostered is one that is with Islam in mind. Amwajdi has shaped my mind. My worldview has been shaped by every single person in this room, whether I know you or I don't. A big part of my worldview is my fellow graduates. All eight of them are very special to me. All eight of them have achieved things that I would never would have thought possible. And all eight of them have supported me and allowed me to become the person I am today. I will never forget any of the laughs, any of the memories, that I've created with you guys, whether it may be um, spilling my chocolate milk all over my clothes, or whether it may be just having fun in the swimming pool, or during PE, or during recess, or at the lunch table, none of these memories will ever leave my mind. I could have never asked for a better class to graduate with, and for those eighth graders, make sure you keep your classmates close, because those those classmates will become your family. And thankfully, my classmates have become my family. Lastly, I'd like to thank my family for being here today. Khatadina, thank you for coming today. If you guys would like to stand up. Mama, Baba, Amor. I really appreciate everything you guys have done for me. And Khadadina, thank you for always letting us come to your house, eat your food, and play on your computer. Although it might have not been the best thing to do, um, it was still very fun. And although you and Khadadina in my eyes are both equally cool, my friends know you as the cool aunt. Mama and Baba, you guys can sit down, it's okay. Baba, I'll start with you. One of the lessons that I've learned, um, or that I've lived by throughout my history at the school and everywhere in my life is the lesson of the mistakes and how mistakes do not define you. Rather, it is the way that you re react to those mistakes that define you. A hadith that, if you know me well, you've probably heard me say this a few times. A hadith that I was taught by my dad is that كل ابن آدم خطاء وخير الخطائين التوابون it is that every son of Adam, every human, makes mistakes. But the greatest of those who makes mistakes are the, those who repent. Those who repent. It is okay to make your mistakes. It's okay to have your faults. Everyone has their faults. And everyone can repent and become better. Mama, <laughs> you have always...
Whenever I'm asked who is my hero or who do I look up to the most, I always say you. I don't know what I'd do without you guys. You guys are the best parents I could have asked for. Sorry. <laughs> And Omar, I know you might have dreaded this part of the speech, but you knew it was coming. And don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. Those stories can be for another time. I'll never forget any of the lessons you taught me. Especially that one day where I didn't want to go to practice and you made sure I regret that decision. We went to the field afterwards and you made me run and run until my run turned into a walk and I couldn't run anymore. But it was the lesson of not giving up not saying, I'm not going to go to practice anymore, I'm not going to continue on my school activities anymore because I'm tired or because I don't want to do it anymore. These lessons will forever be in me, and I will never forget them. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and for witnessing this beautiful graduation and for witnessing all of my beautiful classmates come up here and get their diplomas, inshallah. Throughout the 13 years of, uh, at this school, I've learned many lessons, and I will never forget any of them. And I've definitely, I would definitely say that I have shaped the person that I am today, and I am proud of who I am, and I'm proud of everyone who has come here today, and all my classmates, and who they have become. And without further ado, we can give Ramwajdi his gift in honor of Ramwajdi. We would like to thank him for everything that he has done for us and helping us shape us into the people that we are today. So if my fellow graduates would like to come up here. So this is a gift from all the seniors towards Amawashi. Thank you very much, Mustafa. May Allah bless you and thank you, all the graduates. May Allah bless you and reward you for everything. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you successful in this life and the hereafter, inshallah. Ameen. Let us uh, take a moment of silence in memory of our beloved Aisha Basharo and Nabila Mazuz. There were two students that went to school here and they were classmates. One of them passed in a drowning tragedy in Hillsborough swimming pool. And the other one, because of heart failure, she passed away. Aisha and Nabila, they will be remembered in a, a memorial prize. We'll remember Aisha with the writing contest prize. And Nabila will be remembered in the science prize. So inshallah, it will be announced soon, hopefully in the fall, for both of them. And both of them will be commemorated. Let us remember our beloved great thinker and great leader, Nuhat Tolan. He was the one that supported this work silently behind the scenes. May Allah bless his soul.
Fulan was the father of me. He was. He was a big brother. He was mastermind. Always, when we had difficulty, we will seek his advice and knowledge. Alhamdulillah, his last meeting with myself and respected beloved sister Rania and beloved respected Sahar and brother respected, beloved brother Salahuddin Qadri, we were talking about this project. And we walked together, me and him, and he said, remember the promise, his promise that he was to be buried as a Muslim. He was a very devout Muslim. He was the founding dean of the College of Urban Planning. He's the one that put Portland State in the map because of the College of Urban Planning. He's the one that always defined and defined our relationship in our public square. Without his support and wisdom, we wouldn't have integrated the Muslim community to what it is today. May Allah reward him, may Allah bless him, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensate him with the full compensation. He was a very proud Muslim. He was the greater planner of Cairo during the 60s. But Tulan believed in the integration by design of what we call positive integration. Let us remember my beloved brother Lawrence de Bloch, a man of compassion, a man of love, a man of integrity. If you ask him 5,000, he will give you 10. If you ask him for 50, he will give you 100,000. Irrespect. You know, he believed in this work. He believed in each one of our students because he didn't have children of his own, he and Sister Layla, may Allah bless her. She's still alive. Brother Lawrence de Bloch was a man of integrity and compassion and kindness. He believed as an American Muslim of a European background that there is no way without a multi-racial and multi-ethnic and multi-acceptance of Islam. Today we are divided by isms. Let us bust that isms. The beauty of our faith that he, it encompasses everything. And that's what my beloved brother Lawrence de Bloch. Let us remember Ahmed Al Hizawi, a great architect, wonderful man, great man that started many of our good work through his donation, through his work, through all the support and one of the people that contributed to Waqfuna, our endowment. My beloved mother, Loha Aziza, she used to type for us all the work that we needed to type. Let us remember my beloved brother, Tariq Al Qadiri. He just passed recently. He was a man that dreamed and dreamed. Ten days ago, we were talking, me and him, about how to integrate Pure Hands to become a great, successful, Yemeni American initiative to relief and development. We differed in some times, but most of the time we agreed. He was a man when we did this project, he said he will give 50% of what this project will cost in the flooring. He's the man that did all the flooring. He died last weekend, and it was a very touching, loving, and caring burial and many people that has contributed to them. Let us remember them with Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm ad-Din, iyaka na'abdu, iyaka nista'in, ihdina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Ladhina an'amta alayhim, ghayri al-Maghdubi alayhim, wa al-Dhalil. May Allah bless them all, and may Allah reward them, may Allah accept them in His mercy, and may Allah overcome their shortcomings. And may Allah make us those that are alive to walk and to rethink and to forgive and to accept one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of humanity. We want today to recognize a few of our staff. One of the 
most unique individuals that I met when he was seven years old. That's Zakaria Haqiqi. Zakaria, he took... <laughs> Zakaria took the responsibility and he joined us. He's our creative director. He, he filled a big shoes. That was Rania feeling. And I think he didn't feel it yet, huh? <laughs> With the videography <laughs> and video. May Allah bless you, Zakaria. Zakaria is our employee of the year. Another beautiful year with the COVID challenge is a beloved young sister, our second grade teacher, Maria Mipsis. Somebody needs to talk. I would kindly ask Diala and Elvira to join me to recognize Maryam, please. May Allah bless her, inshallah. Maryam, may Allah bless her and reward her. She always was there as a beautiful leader, the way that Khadija, anha, the way that Aisha and many other companions and beloved wives of the Prophet وسلم, she helped in so many ways. If I list them, you know, it will be as big as this universe. May Allah bless you. Maryam volunteered to be in our CRC, CRC Community <laughs> Relations Committee. <laughs> Last but not least, Zakaria and Maryam, I want you to stay here. Zakaria, come back, please. Last but not least, a beloved young sister, a great Quran teacher, a great creative mind, that you saw the video of the high school and many other videos. You saw the decorative during Ramadan and many others is Muna Al Madhun, a great. <laughs> Muna was dreaming to work at MET at the Muslim Education Trust since she was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And she said, she made dua that we're going to accept her. We are blessed to have Muna today with us. Look at the statue. Muna is also our swimming instructor and Quran teacher, and she runs also with Sister Diala the Arabic and the Quran Institute. Tisha Jawad, would you please join me, please? We want to recognize few students that have been with us. I think today we have two that present, and they have spent five and six and eight years with us. This is a new program that we created and Teacher Jawad will be going over. Would you please, the slides, you know? Muna, the slides. <laughs> Assalamualaikum, Assalamualaikum, everybody. So, as we have seen the growth of our classes and the growth of the amount of students that are here at Oregon Islamic Academy, we realize that we have so many students who have been with us and so many other students who want to be with us. We can't have everybody uh, attend the school because of capacity. And we always wanted to be at that spot. If you were here with us 20 years ago, we had people, we were chasing after people come and 
try Islamic school, try the Islamic school of MIT, try Oregon Islamic Academy. And now we have people calling from Nevada, people calling from Texas and New York and California who want to move here to join. So there's not enough space for everybody, but we've had students here who have spent 10 years of their life here at Oregon Islamic Academy, at the Islamic School of MET. And they've given and they've contributed to this community. And they continue to give to his community. So for the first time this year, we are proud to inaugurate the Muslim Educational Trust Honorary Community Graduates. We define this as students who have spent five or more years at ISMET and OIA, and they have graduated from uh, eighth grade from uh, OIA. And this year we're recognizing three students who reached out to us that they wanted to be part of this graduating class. They're very close to a lot of our graduates. Our first student is Mustafa Usman. He's over here with his family. We saw Mustafa Usman here in, Mustafa's coming up. He didn't know he was coming up today, but he is. We saw Mustafa here during Ramadan, uh, in Tarawi prayers, in the iftars, and uh, Mahmoud, amongst others, dragged a bunch of the students near and far to the Hajjad. He was here in Khayyam. But Mustafa embodies all the aspects of what we want from graduates from Oregon Islamic Academy. He is highly capable, highly intelligent, but incredibly humble. If you've ever met Mustafa or talked to him, the same voice that he has for everyone, he has that all the time. He's incredibly genuine, and he's given, I think, 10 years you were here, right, Mustafa? 10 years. And we wanted to recognize him and his parents as people who have contributed greatly to this community. So Mustafa, congratulations. Mustafa graduated from Westview High School, Sunset High School. And he's going to attend Cornell University. May Allah bless him. He was one of the three producers of the movie Mayor Blake, Mustafa Rashid, Mustafa Osman, and Mahmoud Jawad. May Allah bless you and reward you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Our next uh, community graduate, and he apologized. He wanted to be here tonight, but he has his graduation, his own graduation. And he's actually the graduation speaker at Twelton High School today, tonight. And this is Muhammad Fax. Muhammad Fax. <laughs> Muhammad is also a very close friend with many of our graduates. Uh, he was here for 10 years. Uh, his mother was also a part, Kim Fax, a part of our staff for a long time. Genuine person, great athlete, incredible friend. Um, and highly capable. We had a great talk with him throughout the years when he wasn't here anymore, but he was at Swalton, about what he wanted to do, what he wanted to study. We've seen him here at Juma, and uh, he is one of our honorary graduates. So, Mohammed Fax. <laughs> and lastly, we have Sama Bawani. We don't have a slide for her. Unfortunately, it was too late to make one, but Sama Bawani also, one of the great graduates who spent 10 years, I believe, at, it might be 11 years, I think it was two years of preschool, one year, 11 years, Sama, 10 or 11, who knows counting anymore. But Sama also, <laughs> Sama also reached out to us, uh, very close to our graduates as well. And we'd like to recognize her as an honorary community graduate as well. But she didn't answer the <laughs> survey.
Salma is uh, Mustafa is an Egyptian American, Muhammad is a Syrian American, and Salma is a Latino Yemeni American. Salma is going to San Francisco, University of San Francisco, and she is in Piri Law. May Allah bless you and reward you. Thanks, Teacher Jawad, inshallah. Without further delay, we want to recognize you know, uh, the parents that believed in our high school you know, uh, program. It takes really parents, it takes believing mothers and fathers to be with us. Some of them have been recognized, you know, like Brother Yasser and Sister Rani have been recognized because Omar graduated from here. Omar, would you please stand up, you know? All our alumni, would you please stand up? Ibrahim, Zainab, and Omar, and whoever is here from our alumni, can you please stand up? Omar just graduated from Cornell. May Allah bless him and reward him. Omar is going to work with Amazon, I believe. Huh? Facebook in New York. May Allah bless him, inshallah. And Ibrahim is attending Harvard and hopefully will graduate in two years, inshallah. In, in economics and, and my beloved Zainab, she's attending Williams and she'll be graduating in the pre-med program. So wherever they are, inshallah, may Allah bless you. Omar, I have now a place in New York when I come to visit. <laughs> Believing parents, you know, would you mind, Yasser and, and Rania, since you got, uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to give you another one, but would you please so join us, you know, please. Yeah. We have our beloved Ansari family, Safiya, Ghazi, and Kamran. Would you please join us, please? My family in laws the Afghan, my dear sister Roshan, and Fakir Rahim, would you please join us? Sadia Noor and brother Abdi Bele. Allah bless you. Dear Sister Terry and Brother Hassan, Abdul Qadir, would you please join us? Sister Tracy and Ghassan Abdul Qadir. And Sister Naima Adeh, would you please join us? <laughs> Sister Zuleikha Sakhaudin. Sister Marwa Mahmoud, may Allah bless you, and Brother Muhammad Jawad. Okay, uh, Dr. Polo and Judge Kasubai, would you please join us here to give the word to the diplomas to the students? Yeah, all the seniors, you know, if you line up, please. Muhammad Hassan Abdul Qadir. Muhammad did. <laughs> Muhammad, his, his, his thesis 
you know, perfection in imperfect world. And he debated about the Farabi. Here, this is Muhammad. And the Farabi and, uh, and the great scholar or philosopher Plato, Rayan Kamran Ansari. And stay with your parents, please. Yahya Abdu Bel. Bele. Sheikh Mohammed, would you please join us as a homeroom teacher? Sheikh Mohammed. Where is it? Sheikh Mohammed and uh, Sister Hanan, they received an award from us from the past because of Ibrahim and uh, graduation. Hanan, can you join us, please, with Sheikh Mohammed, please? <laughs> Yusuf Mohammed Ibrahim. <laughs> Mahmoud Mohammed Jawad. <laughs> Aisha Jelani. Omer Rahim. Omer. Mustafa Yasser Rashid. But not least, Sakawa Muhammad Sakawa Din. <laughs> and Yahya got the third place in the Islamic Studies Fair. May Allah bless you, Yahya. This is a trophy for you. Look at teacher Joeria. <laughs> Thank you. Students stay here. Parents, if you don't mind, you know, to take care. Uh, may Allah bless you all and may Allah reward you. Congratulations, inshallah. I would ask all the teachers that taught the high school to come forward. All high school teachers. Sheikh Mohammed, stay here, please. All high school teachers, would you please come forward? Teacher Julie, teacher Jibril. Teacher Joeria, all high school teachers, and Teacher Jawad, all high school current teachers and past teachers, would you, Teacher Maysoon, and Sister Diala and Sister uh, uh, Alvera, would you please? Alvera and Diala. I hope I didn't forget anybody, huh? And Huda, please. <laughs> All the teachers in the front and, and the students in the back. <laughs> you are too tall for the teachers, please, you know. Okay, come closer. Ryan, come closer. Ryan, Ryan, come closer, Ryan. Ryan, come closer, Habibi. Okay. The teachers, you know, that are high in wisdom, come forward, please. Teacher Jueria, Teacher Diala, and Teacher Marwa, come in the front, please. And teacher Huda, and, and teacher uh, 
الفيرا اسكوزي يا مصطفى حبيبي All teachers, look at uh, teacher uh, Miriam, please. Can you see all, Miriam? May Allah bless you in behalf of the Board of Trustees, the Board of Directors. You are graduate now. May Allah bless you. Takbir. One, one, one minute, Aisha, Aisha, <laughs> Aisha, one minute, everybody, one minute. All the graduates that graduated with the orange sash, they graduate with honor. May Allah bless them, and they have met the honor society, the National Honor Society requirement, and our also school requirement. May Allah bless them and reward them all, inshallah, for wonderful teachers. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you, reward you. Mustafa Osman, can you come, please? Mustafa and uh, Salma al Bouani, come and join us, please. One, one minute, one minute, please. You know, Mustafa will be joining you. you know, Mustafa and uh, Salma. Okay, what do you want to do, Mahmoud? Okay, we'll do it on the count of three. As long as you don't get my face in the picture, we'll be good, okay? All right. All right, everybody ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Woo! We graduated. It's okay, we're, we're a little... <laughs>